Hey, Smokey Hill, how we doing? Oh, it's good to see you. Y'all ready to worship tonight? All right, all right. Amen. Hey, if you're watching online, we want to say welcome. We pray blessing over you and where you're at. Worship with us in your living room. Right. <laughs> Y'all ready to worship? Let's do it. I sing for 
all that you've done for me all that you've done for me hey all that you've done for me singing that song just to say Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me all that you've done God and I don't know how your day has been going but I do know that the presence of the Lord is here in this place and I know that each one of us could say God you have done so many great things woke me up this morning. You gave me breath in my lungs. And so this next song we're going to sing says, your praise will ever be on my lips. He is worthy, amen. In every season, it is good to give him praise and thanks. So come on, let's lift our voices. Let's praise the great name of Jesus in this place tonight, amen. Come on, let's sing together. is devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today and faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your kindness makes us whole And you shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own May you making me like you And clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt And rid of all her shame And known by her true name and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, and you will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. Oh, you will be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy. Oh, you will be praised. You will be praised. You will be praised with angels and saints. We sing worthy. and saints we sing worthy are you love and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips oh, oh we praise you love oh, oh you're worthy God oh you're worthy Jesus
mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness It tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine? Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior I'm yours I'm yours forever Jesus Christ My living hope Let's lift our voice, church Sing hallelujah Praise the one who sent me Sing it Hallelujah lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise Your very body Began to bring Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Oh, Jesus is yours Is the victory Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah.
Oh, beautiful. Thank you for singing. Thank you for lifting your voice tonight to give him glory. Well, before you are seated tonight, would you take a moment and say hi to someone? Maybe give a high five, a hug. Share that love of Jesus tonight. And if you're joining us online, why don't you take a moment, grab your phone and text grace and peace to someone who God brings to your mind tonight. HV family. How is everybody? Amazing. This is good. Well, welcome. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Christy, and my husband Mike and I are the co-lead pastors here, and we are so glad that you're here to worship with us tonight. Um, I have just a couple quick announcements. We have got uh, youth stuff going on. So any of you who know youth, have youth, have seen youth around somewhere, um, let them know this Wednesday we're back on with our Wednesday night youth group meetings. So that'll be here at the porch. Um, I think it's at six. I'm real bad at announcements. Well, you should grab our youth pastor and ask him after service. I think it's at six. So maybe uh, just connect with Greg. It'll give you a good chance to look around for more youth to invite. And then... Um, would, would you define youth? Middle school, high school. Okay. So okay. I'm not I included. I feel young, but okay. I am not included. Right. No. Just make it sure. And then we have our whiteout retreat for uh, the high schoolers. If you haven't heard about that yet, again, get with Greg. He's got all the information, but I can tell you it'll be March 17th through the 19th. And there's um, nine different churches, vineyard churches and, um, and our Larkspur church that are coming and sending high schoolers. So if you have never had your students go, it's actually an incredibly powerful time. So we would encourage you to get that information and get connected for that. And then how many of you, was worship not incredible tonight? So good. Um, if you, yes, come on. Come on. If there are any of you hidden musicians out here, which I know there are some of you, okay? So we're going to have a quick conversation. On Thursday, February 16th, grab your calendar. You can mark that we're going to have a worship workshop that night, okay? And it's going to be at um, one of our friend's churches in uh, DTC area, off Arapaho. See, I don't know why I'm doing announcements. I'm real bad at these. But anyways, uh, Marcel and Cindy can give you all the details, so I know who to point you towards. <laughs> Uh, so that'll be Thursday the 16th. I didn't see a single calendar get out there. So if you're a hidden musician, we're coming for you. So just get ready, okay? Or you just really like to worship and you want to like be the one in the audience practicing. That too would be really wonderful. Or, or you love music and you have no discernible music ability like me, mm. but you also would like to learn how to run the soundboard or be a part of the tech team, yeah. which puts the words on the screen, which I promise you is every bit as important, important part of our worship ministry. Truth. Way to go. That's it. That's yeah. all the announcements. You did awesome. We do better together. Good job. Okay. All right. What are we doing tonight? I don't <laughs> I need a moment. Oh, okay. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Good, good evening. Uh, we are, for those joining us online, by the way, good morning. So there you go. Um, so we are doing our series, Now is the Time. And we started a few weeks ago, and we've been kind of working and talking through specifically out of language out of Luke 4. Uh, we've taken this expression, Now is the Time, out of the version of the voice, Luke 4, 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim now, sorry, what time? That now, now is, is the time. time. That's right. That this is the jubilee season of the eternal one's grace. And, and we've been talking about this idea that Jesus came to usher in the kingdom. And, and we love this language, this idea of like, it's time to do something. It's time to get moving again. I don't know what, we haven't even talked about this part yet, but I don't know what it's been like for you to be at this place of, of your season of life and going, man, I feel the pandemic feels a little bit not so in my face anymore, right? It feels like it's a little bit behind us and, behind, and it's like, it's time to go and do stuff and 
do things again. And I think the same is true for our life with Jesus. So we talked about the last, uh, last three weeks, we've been talking about the different parts of how the kingdom advances. We're talking about specifically this idea around the three-legged stool of kingdom advancement, which is woes, works, and word. We've been kind of using this idea and this imagery. You had a really good point that if you took one of the legs out, it would all fall down. Yeah. Yeah. If this, when we consider the, the, ideas of the kingdom of God, any of those things in, on, of their own is insufficient. Two of three is imbalanced. And so when we look at the suffering, um, the woes, the words, the going forth of, of the good news, the gospel, um, and the works or the signs and the wonders that we see, that provides really a balanced and comprehensive kind of overview of the kingdom when we think about what are we talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God. Oh, sorry, you look like you're ready to go. No, I... It, it's, it's, it's my Christy. turn. It's I know. Right That's there. why I was confused. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. we're, we're, it's been a while since we did this, man, since Christmas. Together. We got to get, yep. we got to get back in the right. um, swing of things. So, um, so as we talk about the three-legged stool, the three things, the woes, the words, and the works, what we want to talk about tonight is kind of pulling from each of those things. There were a couple things that as we went through it, we went, gosh, I, I think we should revisit that. I know it was only a couple weeks ago, but man, I want us to draw this out a little bit. We want to talk about how does God actually use this balance? representation of the kingdom in our own lives, in our communities, in those that we live life with. And so when we think about, um, we'll just give quick overviews again in case you missed any of them, you can go back, but we'll just remind you what they are. So when we talk about woes and the suffering that we see in the world, um, you know, the early church, we saw that in their suffering, in their persecution, that's actually where they went out. That's how the gospel literally spread, was the persecution that sent them fleeing in different places. And the ways that the church was established actually came out of suffering. And we don't like to talk about suffering because it's really it's un American. Suffer. No, it just hurts. It's not, it just hurts. It's it, it does ouch. hurt, but it's also un American. Yeah. But when we see the injustices of the world, when we see we're walking through our own bouts of illness or loss or grief or strife or relational brokenness, all of the things that we suffer through, we know in our hearts we yearn for things to be different. We yearn for a different state of being and we yearn for that eternal Sabbath that we'll eventually get. Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven, if you've never read it, it's actually a really great book that talks about, um, we have a pretty weak theology of heaven. And a lot of times we say things like, oh, we don't know what it says. Actually, the Bible has a lot to tell us about what heaven is and what that looks like. And so he says, God uses suffering and impending death to unfasten us from this earth and to set our minds on what lies beyond. And when we experience those things, it's an opportunity, it's an invitation for God's kingdom to come in a way to teach us what is beyond just us and the current. Um, and then of course we talked about in the midst of justice that kingdom justice in the midst of suffering, I mean, is where God gets his way. We know that we serve a God who promises that he is the one who will make all things right. He is the one who will set it back the way it should be, that God desires to bring his now of the kingdom in all of those places of injustice that we encounter even this week, right? Yeah, and so the next, uh, the, the next week, Christy talked about works, which was the signs and wonders, it's the move of the Holy Spirit. And I love the way she talked about this from the standpoint of that, that God wants to come through his spirit to do the miraculous. And that oftentimes the miraculous are ways in which that we don't even recognize. We don't recognize what God's up to, but that he comes to work in our behalf and he comes to meet our needs emotionally and spiritually and, um, and, and even physically sometimes as well. It comes to kind of bring relational healing as well. And this, this, Beautiful picture she talked about that, that Jesus walked around, did all kinds of signs and wonders, including healings. And so what happens often, right, is we look at the, we look at the signs and wonders that are the most dramatic or feel like they're the biggest, the biggest deal, so to speak. And, and we, we specifically pointed on this, on this quote of Richard Foster's where he talked about that the religion of the big deal actually messes things up. That it's, it goes against the things of what God's kingdom came to do. That it should be just something that's expected. It's a natural, it's a part of our lives. She used specifically this idea that God uses works and signs and wonders to illustrate the nature of the king and his kingdom, to demonstrate Jesus' compassion and mercy, 
to, to for uh, repentance, including kingdom advancing. In other words, that we see the kingdom advance through repentance, which, by the way, is a sign and wonder. And then for active movement of justice in our lives, this, this beautiful representation that God's Spirit comes to usher all of these things into place. So then, and then the next week we talked about the Word. Right. So the good news, the gospel, the word of God, and we, obviously we are talking about the word of God going forth and reaching people, the good news actually extending to those who have not yet heard it, to every tongue, to every tribe, to every nation. Um, But we don't just mean words, right? We mean the incarnate word of God, which is Jesus as he was sent to the earth, represented in John 1. Um, He's constantly called the word, the word, the word was, you know, all those things. If you haven't read it, you should go read it. And so um, there's this importance of proclaiming the word, but there's also how we proclaim Jesus, the actual witness where we as followers of Jesus, what does that mean to proclaim the good news, to proclaim Jesus in our lives, in our circle? And we, um, this is what's interesting. Mike shared um, just real briefly last week, I want to talk a little bit more about this. He shared about the circle set versus the centered set theology. And so if you want to, if you throw that first slide up, that'd be helpful. Um, so circle set, we've got Jesus in the middle, right? This is Jesus. And circle set theology says, I really care about who's in the kingdom and who's not in the kingdom. So there's like this circle that gets drawn around. People are kind of represented by all the X's that we see. But the circle gets drawn around and a lot of Christian um, practice says, well, they're either in or they're out. And if you're in, you're in the circle. You can't be with the people outside of the circle, right? Because they're, I mean, there's truth that bad character corrupts good character, right? That is real. But this isn't really how we view the kingdom. How we would challenge us to think about the kingdom is to say that we actually look at how are these exes, how are these people moving either towards the things of Jesus, towards the things of his kingdom, or away from them, right? Because you can be with someone who is proclaimed to be following Jesus and really not be good character, right? We've all seen that too. And so we would actually challenge you, take away the circle completely, that this idea is actually a falsely created representation of the gospel. That Jesus at the center, there's a question of, how, are we moving closer to Jesus? Are we moving away? Yeah, and I, I think the thing we really want to highlight in this is, we are not the ones to define who's in or who's not. That is not our call. And when we, this whole idea around circle set theology creates this human place where we, humans define to others, oh, you're in or you're not. Are you in or you're not? And we just got to be really careful to get out of that place. We are not God. Yeah, so how many of you have heard someone or maybe have asked this question? As you've met someone new, maybe you're like, are, are they saved? Are they in? Right? Have you ever heard that be the first question? That should not be our first question. That puts us in a place of, of judgment, in a place of going, well, are they in the circle? Or are they out? Take the circle out of your frame of reference. Right. This, this might be a little bit... Um, challenging, but that's not our place to judge, right? We cannot judge what we see on the, on the surface. In fact, we don't get to make the decisions of who is in or who is out, even if we think, like some of us, that we know all things, right? And that we should be able to influence maybe that decision. Are you talking about me? No, I'm, no okay. actually, I'm probably confessing my own heart. Um, but what we know is that there is reality in Matthew um, seven seventeen. We see that God warns us that good fruit is grown on good trees and, and bad fruit shows up on bad trees. They don't cross, right? A bad tree that doesn't have good soil, isn't fertilized, isn't taken care of, is not going to bear beautiful fruit. And so we need to be discerning. We need to be aware of those things. We need to um, be, you know, what is it? Wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That's kind of such a dichotomy, right? And yet that's what we're called to do, but we're not the ones who get to make the decisions. God knows the heart. Acts 15, 8 said, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. You'll remember when we talked about the Gentiles being invited, the radical thing that Jesus did for these Jews who were expecting something very specific. And then he said, actually, I care for your oppressors. I love those Gentiles that you hate. And then Romans 8, 27, he who searches our heart knows the mind of the spirit because the the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will. So this is the last little warning. We don't get to also stand in a place of calling people to a morality they haven't ascribed to yet. 
We can't look at the world and say, why can't we all just be walking with these Christian morals or ideals or you're such a bad person. We were all bad people at one point or another before Jesus came and brought his own personal redemption in our lives, right? I feel like that should be a mic drop moment, but probably that's not. Brogan will be upset with you. So um, I think, too, the thing that we often, often have to realize is that we think about this good tree bearing good fruit and bad tree bearing bad fruit from such a right or wrong perspective. I, I would be honest with you and tell you that if you followed me, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you would see there's lots of lemons that come off my tree. There are moments where there's, you know, really great tasting apples, but there are also moments where there's like sour fruit that comes off. That we're all in process, even in that. That they all have places where when those, when that, those moments of bad fruit come out of my life, it's when I go, all right, Lord, what else are you trying to do in me that needs, still needs to be worked out? That we're not always in process, Okay. So, in that vein, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, hey, the things that we've been talking about the last few weeks, this now is the time piece, this, this place around the people, the suffering, the woes, the, the works, the move of the Holy Spirit, and, and the Word, Jesus. These things are all pointing us to some places, and, and I think places that we need to step into in a different way. So, we're going to talk today specifically about reflecting Jesus. How can we be people who reflect word, the word? How can we be people who reflect Jesus? So you go all the way back to the beginning. This is the way God intended it. Genesis 1 talks about that they were created, man and woman, in the image of God. In God's image. If you go back to that original language, the language actually is to reflect God's image to the world. So I want you to hear that. That doesn't mean we're supposed to start looking and acting like Jesus. We're not all going to go out and buy, buy the right kind of clothes and whatever else to look like the Jesus of the chosen, right? That's not the goal. The goal is that we would reflect God in the way that we live. We are image bearers of the Most High God. He has created us to be daughters and sons, to live in relationship with Him, to bear His image. And that as we reflect Jesus, that's when love and action actually shows up. Remember we talked about compassion a few weeks ago. That people in the midst of suffering, there's lots of different ways we can go. We can sympathize with where they are. Or we can even go further and go empathize with where they are. But that compassion actually is, it's a, it's a place where you're actually responding out of action. It's love and action. So Acts 1.8, this idea of being image bearers is... You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so this word, you will be my witnesses, I want you to really focus on that. That's a noun, not a verb. It's not you will go witness. Not you're going to run around and tell everybody everything. It's going to be, no, you're going to live in such a way that you are my witnesses. In other words, it's kind of scary sometimes, right? I have these moments too where I look in the mirror and I go, wait, Jesus, God, God chose me to be what he's trying to say to the world? We're in trouble, right? But this is truth. The people of God are created in his image to reflect his image to the world. You and I as followers of Jesus are what God is, wants to say to the world. And so if we don't live in such a way that we reflect this beautiful invitation of what God, living life with God looks like, we miss the opportunities to really be image bearers. So what's your witness? Is this still me? Yeah, I, it does not say me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> David uh, Kinnaman, and he's a guy who does, uh, he's the kind of leader of the Barna Research Group, and, and he does this fantastic quote. He says, our research shows that many outside of Christianity, especially younger adults, have little trust in the Christian faith. And esteem for the lifestyle of Christ followers is quickly fading among outsiders. They admit their emotional and intellectual barriers go up when they're around Christians. And they reject Jesus because they feel rejected by Christians. All right, let me just share one last thing. I'll turn it over to you, all right? Hey, you don't have to be a Christian. I'm going to be really, really clear. 
Jesus was not a Christian. Did you know that? He was not. What Jesus didn't ask us to be Christians. He didn't ask us to take on these labels that the world uses to identify things. What he asked you to do was to follow him. He says, believe in me, confess, believe, and follow. Followers of Jesus, way less scary than Christians. Start there. By the way, Christians ruin it, right? We, this whole thing around, you, you hear this all the time. I just want to encourage you that even as you engage life with others and people go, are you a Christian? You can go, well, I, I, maybe. But what I am is a follower of Jesus. That's what I do is I try to follow Jesus. And I get it wrong a lot. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. We were kind of laughing when we were preparing, like, do, do people cringe when you tell them you're a Christian? Right? I mean, they cringe when we tell them that we're pastors. And then they're like, Wait, your pastor's to get, wait. This yeah, is we can't leave with that. We don't understand. Yeah, who are you guys? Um, and, and we, the world has a bad perception of Christians, but Christians also are pretty terrible to the world. Let's be honest. I'm not saying every single person in this world has been terrible, but Christians give Christians a real bad name, right? That's truth. And I know, um, as Mike was talking about the language, I think, I, I want to go back to the end of this very quote out of the Kinnaman Research those who are outside of the church, again, this points to this thing of they feel it. They, they believe we have a circle up that says you're out. You're not in. In a lot of ways, that's real. But they reject Jesus because they feel rejected by Christians. They reject Jesus because they feel rejected by Christians. This, to me, does not feel like the reflection of the Jesus that we see in the word of God, Right? So what if our witness can be displayed in being good neighbors? What does that even mean to imagine, am I in my interactions with my neighbors, with those in my immediate circle, my actual neighbors, the people that you know and live life with that not a single one of us on staff will ever, until you bring them, get a chance to even meet them or touch their lives or hear their story? What if being a good neighbor could actually look like just witnessing Jesus through you. What if it didn't require you to say anything other than right. just to be kind? Right. Like, let's try being nice people. Right. So years ago, our friends Jay, Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon wrote a book called The Art of Na Neighboring, and it came out of um, this time with City Unite folks and uh, this kind of gathering of pastors across the front range that we've been a part of for years. But they were at a town meeting in Arvada, and the mayor looked at them and said, the majority of the issues in our community that we're facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community of great neighbors. <laughs> How convicting is that for a group of pastors coming to serve the government, serve the city, and they show up and they go, could you just be a little bit more like Jesus told you to be? Ouch, right? That's going to leave a mark. The greatest commandment out of Luke 10, 25 through 29, and it draws back to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. We see on one occasion, this is what the word says, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And this guy answers, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. None of this should be news. We've done a lot of study around this, right, church family? But then Jesus, the, the rest is love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. You, that word is the reflection of him, right? Do this and you will live. But then the law, the expert, this guy's like, well, who's my neighbor? Like, let's get real clear. What, what box do I have to check in order to live this life that you promise, right? What are the motives of this guy's heart? He's an expert in the law. He, he's really wanting to both test Jesus and justify himself and make sure like, I'm in, right? Like, I'm in the circle, right? Do we see this theme? 
this personal justification that comes. And I'll say, when we first heard this, when we read the book and we heard this message, we were really convicted because we were um, doing a church plant and we kind of knew our neighbors. And frankly, I think I was a really good neighbor by just not calling the police on a few of them a lot of the time, okay? I'm just going to be honest. We had some really, really fun neighbors. Um, now, we had our one neighbor across the street, which they they had been uh, pastors, this guy and his wife, and they actually then moved out of our neighborhood and their, his mom moved in and she was wonderful and, and she was so like us. It was really easy to love her well, right? She, she would pray. She, she just was an amazing woman. She was really easy to love. And then the rest were a little harder to love. We had our immediate neighbors right next to us who were all 20 something and they had a hot tub that literally sat outside of our kids' windows and they were out every night with different companions and different partying elements and all kinds of things making lots of really loud noise, not of the prayerful kind. Um, and then we had the neighbors immediately behind us and they would, uh, they used their backyard as their timeout spot. So they would put their kids out there to cry it out, which about gave our dogs a nervous breakdown. Uh, that was a really bad situation. We, there was like a hole in the fence that like our dog tried to, you know. The dog never recovered. It was, no, no, he did not. He was, that was bad. Then we had the lawn lovers. And some of you may recognize this story. These, these we've talked about them before because they were so funny. They would spend just an inordinate, inordinate number of hours grooming their lawn to the precise one and an eighth inch height in this like matrix pattern. And I was out mowing the lawn one day and I thought, I'm such a good neighbor. I'm going to go mow their lawn. I'm just going to extend it, right? And that did not go over well. It turns out that behavior did not bless my neighbors or reflect Jesus to them in a way that, um, and luckily my husband kind of set me straight on that. But Kinnaman goes on to it say- It was a little late. You cut it really, really low. I did. Yeah. I did. But it looked real pretty. <laughs> So we have to be considerate of how we neighbor with people who are not us, right? And Kinnaman goes on to say that outsiders, their most common reaction to the faith is that they think Christians no longer represent what Jesus had in mind. That's convicting. If that doesn't hurt, it should. Yeah, that should hurt. That's the mayor looking at the pastor saying, would you just be better neighbors? in our community, right? They, outsiders believe that Christianity in our society is not what it was meant to be. For many people, the Christian faith looks weary and threadbare. They admit they have a hard time actually seeing Jesus because of all of the negative baggage that now surrounds him. So I confess, when we use language like follower of Jesus, there's a distancing to Christian, and we actually learned that on the mission field years, in, like probably two decades ago, people going, oh, if you're a Christian, you love George W. Bush. And we were like, what? Like, it was the weirdest experience for us. But when we said we follow Jesus, it opened doors. And we went, this is interesting. And then you begin to see yeah. that everywhere, not just on the mission field. Um, but for us, even that nowadays isn't enough because the reflection that we've given of Jesus often is not accurate or inviting. Yeah, we're actually kind of working against the tie, so to speak. Now we're not just in the place where it's, it's you know, Christian people really go, oh, okay, whatever. Now it's like Christian actually brings up like frustration and anger and dislike from others where you're immediately labeled. You're having to actually work harder just to even go, wait, I'm just a normal person. I swear. I'm just, and I will not let my wife cut your grass, okay? Again. Ever again. Ever again. And, and I, I, as Christy's sharing some of those stories, I, like even the cutting the grass one, it's like it's a great example of what not to do, yep. right? There are certain, certain ways to come alongside and help and other ways where it's maybe a little less helpful. Now, sometimes asking if you can mow your neighbor's yard, that's super helpful, right? It can be. I'd be like, yeah, mow away. When, that when, would bless me. When, when the guy's got a 10, Anyways, a 10 right. yard by 10 yard patch of grass that he's mowing in perfect lines, that looks like the crisscross of Coors I've Field. Learned. Yeah, it's not, yeah. You just don't mow the grass. Ask. So this is what we've learned. So as, as followers of Jesus, though, we're trying to say, let's, let's re, reshape the language, even the way in which we communicate. And if we look back even at this story that Jesus is engaged with, this is the kind of people we don't want to be, right? People are, he, what he's really saying when, it, is when he says, who's my neighbor? What he's really saying is, who's not my neighbor? Who can I exclude? Who can I treat as if they're others and they don't matter? And so Jesus just was like, he blows it all up and goes, all right. And I love that Jesus does this, right? He doesn't always answer questions right off the bat. It's a lot of times he'll tell stories. So he tells a story. 
And this is a story that I'm sure many of you remember and have heard, and maybe it's one you even had somebody teach you at some point, and you go, yeah, I like that story, and, here's, and this is why. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, let me explain why this, is, this would be like, this would be one of those moments as Jesus tells a story, the crowd would have gone, what? What, what, what did he just say? So he tells a story, and it's a common in that day to use stories as a way of saying, hey, everybody gets to be a part, okay, and, and there are moral lessons. And so as, even as Jesus says a priest and then a Levite, so there, basically it'd be like a, a, I don't know, lead pastor and the youth pastor, okay? I don't know, children's pastor, whatever. So, or maybe it's even a cleric or somebody else who works at a church. But the point is, two people who should know better, who know the law, who should be stepping in and coming alongside and helping this person, choose not to. Now, there's all kinds of really good legal these language around pharisaical law where they could have said, well, if he's actually dead and we're ceremonially unclean, we can't actually perform our duties, blah, blah, blah. Jesus would say, that's a pile of poop, okay? So, the third person, what everybody else would have expected in that moment is the third person would have been just an average, every ordi everyday, ordinary Jew. By the way, a Jewish man. And Jesus blows it up. He picks somebody who is kind of their mortal enemy. Samaritans weren't just Gentiles. They were worse than Gentiles. Because they were half Gentile, half Jew. at somewhere along the line. They were people that the Jews thought had been, been set aside from God's favor because they intermarried with Gentiles. And so they weren't just bad people. They were like the judged bad people. So like when Jesus has that moment at the woman of the well, there's a Samaritan, like it's scandalous when those guys come back and see this, him, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. Like it would have been scandalous. So the crowd probably in that moment went, what is happening? It was disorienting even as Jesus is saying this. What he's challenging this idea is it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter your income level. Everyone can be a good neighbor. That's the invitation, right? Yeah. So um, the Samaritan man, he took pity on the hurt man, right? And um, I like that the kind of better description of that word is actually divine compassion. Throughout the word, you, you see that Jesus was moved with compassion. And it's this, if you study the, the origin of that word, it's this like visceral response within his gut, like moved with compassion, which is what we see the Samaritan man do. He went to this man who was hurt and he bandaged his wound, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, meaning he would have to then walk alongside him, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, so he took care of this guy that whole day. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So this Samaritan was love in action, right? He had divine compassion. He had empathy. He, what's interesting is, as you mentioned, both the priest and, and the Levite, they Oil and wine specifically were used in the temple for sacrificial offerings, um, and, and they would have had them on hand. So yes, they would have had the, oh, I gotta balance this, do I wanna get blood on me because then I'm unclean, do I, and then I gotta, you know, all the things. But literally, they, were carry, they would have been carrying what they needed to help this man right. laying there. And so, um, so it's just this beautiful symbolic picture, I think, of Jesus showing up in this man's suffering with tangible, real ways to meet his needs. It's really beautiful. Um, anyway. Yeah, so then the, the story goes on. Jesus finishes his story. He looks at this guy who's asking the question, who can I avoid? Who can I ignore? Who can I pretend doesn't exist? And he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And I think this, the answer is very telling. He can't even say the Samaritan. 
He just says, the one who had mercy on him. He can't even use the word. He can't even describe the person. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So it's like, hey, you know, your mortal enemy did right. Why don't you try a little bit of that, right? Oh, man, this whole thing around spiritual pride and humility is off the charts. And I'm going to tell you, church family, can we just talk for a minute as a family? Can I, can I just be honest with you? What holds us back so often from moments where God might really want to do something amazing is our own pride. And whether we want to admit it or not, we have a spiritual pride and it seeps into all of us. By the way, it hit, and if you're sitting there going, not me, Mike, trust me, you've got it. Okay, I know I have it. It's something I wrestle with all the time. This place of, just because, just because there's knowledge does not mean that you're walking with the Lord. Just because you're well-studied, just because you have a whatever, it, it doesn't mean that. And we have to be really careful that we don't miss God opportunities. So when we think about woes and works and word, this woe, this, this person who's been beaten on this, by the way, we left out the, the fourth character of the story, right? The person who's been beaten on the side of the road and is left dying and bleeding, hoping somebody will come along and help. We could do a whole sermon just on that person. But you talk about somebody who's in a place of suffering and then coming along and going, do we miss those moments where God goes, step in and help? Now, if we step in in places where God's not leading, they go really bad, by the way. So we have to be really aware of God's presence and his leading. And then bringing Jesus into the moment. But by the way, we're not going around talking Jesus. We're going around being Jesus. We are image bearers reflecting his image by the way in which we live and do things. We got to get out of our own heads. We got to get out of our own pride. We have to walk in this place of humility and go, Lord, what are you doing? How do I join you? And so when we, when we look at what it means to be an, a reflection of Jesus, um, what does it look like? We all put ourselves in the story, right? Where we go, oh, would I be the one to stop? Right? I, I put myself in that story, in that question. Would I be that one? And yet I think your point of the fourth person is perhaps the most powerful perspective of all because we all have people in our lives who, who are that fourth person, who believe it or not are waiting to be asked to come to church to find a state of anything that brings hope. They're wanting to be seen and needing to be met, right? In their places of the worst suffering with the truth of Jesus, not in a way that rams it down their throat. If what you believed isn't wrong or isn't right, would you want to know, right? Effective argument, but what are you trying to win? Are you trying to win an argument? Or are you trying to win a soul for the kingdom? David Kinneman in his research says that embracing truth without holding grace in tension leads to harsh legalism. Just as grace without truth devolves to compromise. This is, this is as much about our sanctification as we journey through this life as anything else. Because we're not asking you to dilute the gospel. We're not asking to be a church that is seeker friendly and, and you know, just throws like whatever. That's not, we're not asking you to compromise. What we're asking you to do is to take the very heart of what drew you to Jesus that very first time and ask him how you can reflect that to the one lying in the ditch, the one who's been beaten, the one who has been humbled by life's circumstances in whatever way that is, right? We need to, we do, as people who are following Jesus, we live in contrast to the world and that's real, but we aren't the judges of the world. We're not the morality police. We aren't the ones, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I tell people like, your conviction is not from me. I'm not the one that you are accountable to in the end which is incredibly freeing. And parents, if you haven't got that yet, my kids, they disappoint us all the time. They also do really wonderful things all the time. But in the end, my identity is not based on them making the decisions that align with what I've trained them to do because they are accountable to the Lord before they're accountable to me, right? That has nothing to do with being a good neighbor. Unless some of you maybe need to be reflecting Jesus differently to your kids. Maybe, maybe that's real too, right? 
How do we be good neighbors that represent both the grace of Jesus, the truth of the gospel, and we hold those in attention that actually reflects the heart of Christ, who is willing to go anywhere, who is willing to say anything, who is willing to push into the uncomfortable and the awkward to be there. And also respected people's response too, right? Like if I had asked my neighbor, should I mow your lawn? And he was like, please don't touch my lawn ever again. If I went and touched his lawn next week, that would be not okay. That would not, that would be completely dishonoring, right? What kind of neighbors- yeah, By the way, just to be clear, you did apologize to that guy. Yeah. 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 And never touched his lawn again. And never touched his lawn. True statement. Yeah. But uh, the research, the Barner research goes on to say, it's ultimately your task to interpret the trends for your context and for the decisions you make each day about how you represent Christianity to others. We can do nothing about those who have been hypocritical, those leaders who have um, made a bad name for the church, those who have done really awful, horrific things in the name of Jesus or in spite of what they claim about Jesus. We can't do anything about that, but we have the authority in our own lives to choose what kind of image bearers we are going to be and what kind of good neighbors we're gonna to choose to be, servant neighbors that are full of grace and love above all else. If you find yourself tempted to be the morality police, you should ask yourself, is this love or is this judgment? Are you feeling convicted oh, with, yeah, man. are you okay? <laughs> like, sorry. So the questions we could ask, what kind of neighbors do you have and what kind of neighbor will you be? Wow, I feel like we should sit in that one for a minute. Yeah. So let's, let's finish up with a couple thoughts. One is um, they talk about, Jay and Dave talk about this in their book, Our Neighboring. The difference between the, the having a good motive and a, and a bad motive. The, the bad motive is this ulterior motive thing, right? Where you, you go in thinking, I'm going to pretend to be nice to this person so they'll accept Jesus, right? And, um, and you manipulate or you try to like... And maybe it's not even that obvious. Like maybe you're just trying to be like friendly, but maybe your underlying motives are... I will befriend them that they may yeah. come in. Maybe. Maybe. No evangel dating, okay? None of that That's stuff. That's a big no. That's a big no. All right. So, I, and I'm, I, I, you could date whoever you want to, but don't just go, well, I'm going to just go date somebody who doesn't know Jesus so I can lead him to the Lord. That's, that's a mistake. That's going to go bad, I promise or you. Or justify it, or the just, relationship. Yeah. Anyway, so we could go on. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, we won't. We need to get out of parenting mode for a moment. Sorry. Woo. So there's a difference between ulti the ulterior motive versus what they describe as the ultimate motive, right? The ultimate motive means is my long-term goal is the same as God's, where I would seek kingdom justice, where God gets his way in the life of every person on this earth. So yes, my ultimate goal is that everyone would come to know God because that would be the beautiful representation of God's kingdom justice. And his word actually says that. He says that he has written eternity in their hearts. Yeah. That every single person in your, in your realm has eternity written on their hearts. What would happen if you actually, there was a, a divine like locking in of that? Like you know how to help them find, grab hold of that. Yeah. Yeah, anyways. That's good. So what should you do with that? Pray for it? Pray that it would come out? Well, what Jay and Dave say. Well, they do. I, yeah, you're, okay. So Jay and Dave say, we don't love our neighbors to convert them. We love our neighbors because we are converted. As followers of Jesus, we're supposed to love people because of what he did for us. We love, love, not fear, right? We're trying to make it, like, just and by the way, can we just be honest too? Let's just be normal. Oh yeah, remember we're not going to pray weird. We're not going to be weird prayers. Yeah, be a human. Can we be not weird followers of Jesus to our neighbors? Just be a human. Can we be not weird neighbors? Everyone say it together, ready? I am not, not going to be, be a, a weird, weird neighbor. neighbor. No weird neighbors. Some of you didn't say it. No I want neighbor. you to say it. <laughs> just don't be weird, okay? Just be normal. Just be who you are. Maybe if who you are is a little weird, then okay, you can be weird. But just yeah, be, be who authentic. you are all the time, okay? And so, remember, we're reflecting Jesus. So the goal is that, not that we have to be perfect, 
but that we're image bearers. By the way, one of the most disarming things we can do as followers of Jesus is be honest about the places we struggle. Confess. One of the beautiful things I've, I've read, he, Donald Miller did a book called Blue Light Jazz many years ago, and he talked about going to a campus where they created a confessional booth. And people would come in the confessional booth, and rather than, and people would go, am I supposed to confess my sins to you? And they would say, no, we're actually here to confess the sins of Christianity towards humanity all these years. It turned people upside down. I know what to do with it. Let's just be people who are real. Like, yeah, I, man, I'm having a terrible day. Kick the dog. Uh, I don't know. Threw a rock at my car. I don't know. I, I can't think of some. He didn't actually do those things, but you'd be like, maybe I was a jerk today. Yeah, right? like, well, that's could be real most too. days, actually, I could say that. So, love and action. Think about who's around you, who's in your life, and how are you reflecting God to them? How are you reflecting Jesus to them? It's really that simple. And then we do this other little thing where we invite the Holy Spirit and we pray. God, can you please move on the heart of so-and-so? And if you're like, I don't know who so-and-so is, yeah, you do. They're coming to mind right now. Move on their heart, Lord. Let that thing that you've already written on their soul come out. And let me have a chance to even have a conversation with them. We are image bearers created to reflect God to the world not ourselves, God. So, just remember, you're not responsible to save anybody. I have yet to save a single person in this world, including myself. And only Jesus can do that. How about arguing people into the kingdom? Have you done that? Never happened. As a matter of fact, the, the few people I know that did get talked into the kingdom by argument left. They didn't like it. I don't blame them. Because at some point you don't like it because you've, you've lost all your proof. Life hits you. So, we're going to be people who are not weird. Right? Not weird neighbors. Not weird. We're going to reflect Jesus to those that are around us, right? We're going to look for the person who is suffering. And it may not be suffering in the physical way or the, or the emotional way, but look for those around you. Ask for God's eyes. And then pray. Let's get out of the way so that Jesus is what they see. Amen? All right, so here's my challenge. We're, we're going to take communion, and we, we think about this... Um, just so you know, there's communion buckets up here by the cross and over here on the side. Feel free, you can um, grab them. But, oh, and some of our staff is getting up to help too. Um, I want you to think about that question again. What kind of neighbors do I have? And what kind of neighbor will I be? And I want you to think about it in the context of Jesus at the Last Supper. I want you to think about the kind of neighbor that Jesus sat across from and chose to give his life for. After calling his shot, his enemy shot, the guy who was his friend and with him, who would betray him, that's the neighbor Jesus chose to look at and say, I will lay my life down for you. That was the kind of neighbor Jesus was to the neighbors he had. So if you have elements, let's uh, pull these out. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So for some of us, we need to take just a moment and ask God to forgive us for all the ways in which we have represented him poorly. And just let that go. Just say, Lord, come. So Jesus, thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you that, that through you, we have complete forgiveness. Thank you that through you, we have freedom. So let's take the bread together. same way after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until He comes. This is a reflection of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins to wash us. Lord, we thank you that you are full of grace, full of love, full of mercy, full of truth and freedom. We remember now, Lord. Let's drink together. So at one, we, can we all stand, please? We're going to close with some worship. And uh, as always, with, if we could have a few of our uh, worship team folks that have been, I'm sorry, prayer team folks. <laughs> worship team, you stay right where you are. You're doing great. Prayer team. If we have a few of our prayer team available on either side, and uh, just, just as folks to be available to pray with you. If you've got places where you just need the, you need somebody to come alongside you and pray for you. Maybe you find yourself like going, right now I'm kind of suffering a little bit. I just could use somebody to walk alongside and pray for me. Uh, just know they're glad to do that. If you're in this place where you're going, I just need the Lord to break my heart for those that don't know him. Let somebody come alongside. Let somebody come alongside and pray for you in that. Okay? So let's just invite, let's invite you now just to take some, feel free to move around and we're going to worship while we do that. Okay? With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south From east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Oh, were the whole Echoing his eminence, then his name would burst from sea and sky, and from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. His praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ be magnified Oh, we sing to you Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified. Jesus, 
Cause I won't bow down to idols I'll stand strong and worship you And if that puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same Oh, Christ be magnified Let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me Oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me Be magnified, Jesus and goings, God, would you be magnified? It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. I bless you to go out and remember that eternity is etched on your hearts. I bless you to be a reflection of Jesus this week. Let him be magnified. Bless you. We're going to continue to worship. You're welcome to go, but you're welcome to stay. Our prayer team will still be around the room. Maybe you need to come and grab some communion for this week. But be blessed. You are so loved. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, Mike and Christy Colley here. We're the lead pastors at SHV, and we wanted to personally invite you to join us in person on Saturday nights for service at 5 p.m., worship and community. You know, there's a special thing about actually being with other people yeah. in the room and learning what life with God looks like. And the SHV community is full of incredible people from different backgrounds, and we're all learning how to follow Jesus together. Yeah, so whatever your story, whatever your history, whatever your dreams for the future, you have a place at the table here at SHV. Yeah, and we would love to get the chance to know you better. And not just we in a, in a large sense, but for Christy and I, we would love to get to know you. So if you are around on a Saturday and it's your first time in person, please come say hello to us. We'd love to have a chance to meet you. Yeah, and remember, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. We are all better together. And we hope to see you soon on Saturday nights. Yeah. God bless. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you soon on a Saturday.